Dear ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us today. I would like to thank Mrs. Kalisperas and the Hellenic Center for organizing this event and giving us the opportunity to discuss Greek shipping in a historical perspective. I would also like to thank my, thank my colleagues for agreeing to join me on this journey today. Us Greeks often take pride in our long history In our long history and the many achievements we can boast across the centuries. This is an integral part of our national myth which comfort us and help us forget our current difficulties. Our history, our stories if you prefer, also help us understand how we made it here, what route we followed and what obstacles we had to overcome along the road. Let us talk about one of these stories tonight, the story of the 18th century Greek shipping. This was a time when today's flourishing Greek shipping took off. It was not the beginning, but it was a key period of rapid expansion and precious growth. So far, we knew that 18th century Greek shipping was important, or at least that it was important enough to permit Greek seamen to take an active part in the Greek War of Independence and fight some legendary battles against the Turkish fleet. In school, we have learned about Andreas Miaoulis, Lascarina Bobulina, Constantinos Canaris, and many others who were famous for their gallantry at sea. But we knew little or nothing about their activities before the war or their previous naval experiences. With that in mind, a research project was submitted by Professor Jelina Halaftis of the Ionian University and eventually financed by the European Union and the Greek Ministry of Education in 2004. The project was designed to produce new knowledge about the sea routes, maritime areas and trading cargoes of the 18th century, Mediterranean, the period before the Greek War of Independence of 1821. The project was carried out by an extensive team of researchers, academic historians, postgraduates and PhD students from Greece, as well as Turkey, Italy, Holland and Malta. For the needs of the project, we turned to a variety of archives, kept mostly in European port cities. The scope and volume of the material collected was quite broad, ranging from sources related to port activities like the quarantine registers of Malta, Genoa and Marseille, or records of contributions made to the Seamen Association in Venice to sailing permits and licenses to carry arms on board issued by the Ottoman authorities in Constantinople and the Habsburg authorities in Trieste. The project was a success as you can probably tell, not least by the sheer size of the volume we are discussing tonight. Much was learned about Greek maritime history in the 18th century. The trading routes, the maritime areas and the nature of the trade itself became clearer. Our findings offer new insights into maritime trade in the Ionian and the Aegean seas and its integration with the Black Sea, the Western Mediterranean and the Atlantic. We now have a much better understanding of the interconnection of different areas and the way sea trade was organized. We have come to realize that the evolution of Greek maritime trade meant expanding to Black Sea ports and connecting them with the Western Mediterranean and the Atlantic, particularly for the purpose of trading wheat. And we have traced the formation of new Greek communities in different port cities to the expanding network. In the long history of trade and the founding of new communities, London was one of the links. The Greeks played a key role in expanding and transforming it into a principal maritime and trading centre in the second half of the 19th century. The book we are discussing tonight is the product of this project. It consists of no fewer than 890 pages, organised into 21 chapters written by 13 different authors, all of them members of the original research team. In short, it offers no light reading. Yes, it is an impressive volume that talks about Greek maritime history. That is more, what is more, it's written from the perspective of the sea. The Aegean and the Ionian seas are at its very centre. The people and mariners involved in trade, the products transported from the 
from or through those areas, the vessels used, the zeros followed, and the trade methods developed in order to adjust to a changing environment and profit out of it. Those are the main characters and storylines in the book. Let us sketch, using a broad brush as possible, the brief outline of our main storyline, the evolution of grip shipping in the 18th century. The 18th century is an important age in European and global history. It is the century of maritime trade, which transformed its shipping. Europe's industrial revolution intensified trade in raw materials and ma manufacturing goods. Raw materials such as cotton, olive oil, tobacco, and foodstuffs from Europe's urban, for Europe's urban population intensified trade in the Eastern Mediterranean. Toward the end of the 18th century, Black Sea cereals were regularly shipped to West European markets. Greek seamen and merchants taking advantage of the continuous Anglo-French wars became the main long-distance transporters along these routes. At the beginning of the 18th century, around 1700, Ionian seamen operated mainly inside the Ionian Sea, but also exported goods from Epirus and Peloponnese to Adriatic ports, such as Venice, Trieste, and Ancona, Sicilian ports like Messina, as well as Malta. Greek ships sailed to neighbors in southern Italy, but some of them reached as far as Lecco. They mainly operated within a limited area restricted by ge geographical and political circumstances. Malta was a hub for the Ionians and was visited by ships owned by seamen from Esologi and Kefalonia. Those traded mainly in timber from the forest of Epirus around Prevesa and local agricultural products such as fruits, cheese and cereals. At that time, Esologi was under Ottoman rule while Kefalonia and Prevesa and the Venetian rule. Although Malta had been visited by Ionian ships since the turn of the century, it would be not before 1760 that ships from the Aegean coming from islands like Hydra, Spetses and Psara started to arrive in the port of Valletta, carrying mainly cereals. Aegean seamen developed trading methods using their knowledge of Ottoman administration and the local waters. Up to 1760, for example, ships from Hydra, Spetses and Sara mainly traversed their route between Polos and Thessaloniki to Constantinople, serving the capital's needs in Syria. Although they were obliged to transport wheat to the capital at a fixed price, at the same time they had the opportunity to make a sizable profit by selling part of their cargo on the free market. Being Ottoman subjects, they could enter the Black Sea and engage in cereal trade from Romanian lands. In 1760, Aegean ships mostly navigated in Eastern Mediterranean, sailing between Alexandria, Cyprus, Crete, and the shores of Turkey and Palestine. After 1760, when Western Europe's demand for cereals increased, they started carrying the same cargo further west to Leghorn, Genoa, Marseille, Barcelona, Alicante and Gibraltar, as well as to the Atlantic, all the way up to London and Amsterdam, or on the other side to Buenos Aires and Montevideo in the south, or Providence in the north of the Americas. They split the route between Odessa and Malta or Marseille in three legs, turning Psara, Hydra or Spetses, depending on their origin, and Malta into cereal trading hubs, used to load and unload cargo. That way, a small island like Psara could become a major cereal exporter, whereas in fact, of course, it was only an intervening loading port. But those small islands, with their large fleets, became important trading, maritime and shipping centers, <coughs> complete with shipbuilding facilities and shops specialized in catering for, to the needs of ships and their crews. They also became important information hotspots, places where news about wars, politics, and new measures against piracy or contraband was compiled and disseminated. In many cases, trade from Volos, for example, was illegal because the Ottoman Empire was more interested in feeding its people than exporting foodstuffs. But seamen were traders walking in a different direction, often with the collaboration of local Ottoman authorities. 
Despite the presence of different authorities, Ottoman or Venetian, French or British, operating in and controlling different parts of the Mediterranean, by the end of the 18th century, Greek trade succeeded in flourishing in a kind of global common market beyond borders. Greeks became specialized in cereals. During the Napoleonic Wars, they traded in blockaded areas and, though flying a neutral flag, still had to face the perils of war. In some cases, they <coughs> sailed in convoys and armed themselves with cannon and guns to defend their ships against foreign naval forces or pirates. Seamen were also experienced in the use of guns, swords and rifles. According to the license issued by the Ottoman authorities in 1816, Andreas Vokos, Miaulis' ship, carried eight cannons, 30 guns, 40 knives, 40 pistols and 40 rifles. The number of knives, pistols and rifles <coughs> corresponded to the number of the ship's crew. Each of the 40 men on board had a gun, a pistol and a rifle at his disposal. Greek ships fly different flags, depending on the waters they sailed through and the port they entered. For example, Panagis Koduris originated from Kefalonia in 1785, when arriving in Moritza, coming from Tangarok in southern Russia, mentioned as place of origin Tangarok, maybe because of the Russian flag of his ship, although in 1800, with the Russian flag, he declared as place of origin Kefalonia. Until 1800, he changed different flags, such as Venetian, Ottoman, and Russian, but in 1805, he flied the Seven Islands flag. The 18th century saw trade between the Ottoman Empire and Western Europe flourish. So while many sailors sailed to the West, others, merchants, transported goods by land, using animals to expand the wrestler trade to Vienna, Budapest, Frankfurt, and Leipzig. They visited large annual fairs and established important colonies across Western and Eastern Europe. This was the time when Greeks expanded to establish communities in South Black Sea ports such as Odessa, Taganrog, Rostov on Don, in Romanian lands such as Bucharest, Braila and Ismail, and in Western Europe in places like Marseille, Genoa and London. Members from the families of sheep owners and merchants active in land or sea trade settled in different cities and helped manage long traded routes across Europe and Russia. People from Chios and Kefalonia coordinated extended networks linking Tangarok and Odessa with Vienna, Trieste, Marseille and London. Families like the Rallis, Lovokanakis, Valiano, Stilitsi, Skaramaga, Mavrogordato, to name but a few, Organized Greek communities in European cities, built churches, founded schools, became no notable members in local societies and engaged in global trade. This was a rough sketch of Greek maritime history according to this new publication. It is largely thanks to research grants and the existence of archival material kept in different parts of the world that research projects like the one underpinning in this book can shed new light in various aspects of the past. Just like a compass allows seafarers to find their bearings in the water, history helps us understand ourselves in time and answer questions about our origin and our place in the world. The leading role played by Greek shipping today draws on a rich maritime tradition. Its leaders are the latest successors in a long line of people dating back to the 18th century. Greece's maritime tradition has been preserved through time by different generations of seafarers and sheep owners. Knowledge and experience have been exchanged, shared amongst partners and sheep owners, handed down from father to son. New routes have been charted and new markets have been conquered. Still, it is always useful to know one's origin and historical trajectory because it is quite likely that one is the last link in a long chain of personal histories. And this knowledge makes us more self-confident and better prepared to face the future. Thank you. Thank you, Katerina, for that um, interesting talk and sort of an introduction, really. I'm going to pick up where Katerina left off, sort of starting in the 1820s. Katerina covered the earlier period. 
I'm sort of uh, going to bridge the gap between Katarina's uh, presentation and Ilias's presentation. Um, I'll be it's not strictly speaking uh, about shipping, but I'll be approaching shipping from, a, from the angle of Greek family and business networks during the 19th century, um, focusing on the Raleigh Brothers of London um, and several other places as well. Um, my emphasis, as I said, will be on family, so you're going to hear a lot of names. I don't worry, you don't have to remember them all, but you'll see that certain names are repeated and those are the networks I'm talking about. Um, and uh, I'll also mention a lot of the port cities that Katrina referred to, uh, Marseille, Leghorn, i.e. Livorno, uh, Trieste, Odessa, and uh, go much further afield to Calcutta and Bombay, New York and New Orleans as well. Um, the key to understanding the success um, The key to understanding the success of the Kean business model, uh, as represented by Raleigh Brothers, is understanding the network of business partnerships that were cemented by blood ties, um, usually. Brothers, sisters, cousins, um, in-laws, the families of wives and husbands. Um, and the Raleigh Brothers, uh, based here in London, are probably the most representative example and model for other diaspora entrepreneur families in the 19th century, because they were the most successful. Um, the wider kinship network provided an endless source of business partners, financial backers, and office per down to office personnel of every rank, from directors down to uh, junior clerical staff in offices around the world. Um, and these are people that could be trusted uh, in almost every sense of the word. Um, in terms of success of the business networks and the social networks established in the UK um, and other countries where the members of the Raleigh family were established, uh, we see how this worked uh, and was a successful model. Um, the sources that one would use to uh, study this kind of um, phenomenon uh, are scattered. Um, Katerina has referred to the type of uh, business archives that are coming to light. You have to go to national archives around the world, Western Europe and Russia, to find uh, relevant materials. Um, new sources are constantly being identified um, many by Katerina and Jelena and their team. Uh, they're discussed in the book that was presented tonight. In terms of studying the family networks themselves, we have to use a different type of source, although the names uh, are repeated again and again in the kind of documents Katerina referred to. Um, when we're talking about the Hian family networks, we're indebted to one person in particular, and that's Philip Argenti, whose picture uh, is on screen. He was a lawyer and diplomat based here in London. Um, he continued genealogical research initiated by his father and grandfather. So this was genealogical research into the Hian families uh, that was started in the 18th, uh, 1880s, 1890s. So they started when people who were born at the end of the 18th century were still living. So that's why he was able to compile these wonderful uh, genealogical records for the Hian families that were published uh, in 1955 by the Oxford University Press as the Libro d'Oro de la Noblesse de Hio. Um, to big volumes like that. He also wrote numerous historical studies on the island of Hios uh, and its relations and its, um, uh, with other, uh, with the maritime uh, history in general of the Aegean, um, usually at his own expense. Uh, so we're greatly indebted to him. Without him, it wouldn't be possible to, um, to even put together a paper like the one I'm gonna to present tonight. Um, we're also indebted to other descendants of the um, families from Hios, and in particular, Christopher Long and Michael uh, Gelasto, who have two wonderful online resources which um, are mined every day by people, academics, descendants of the families, just the general public. Um, they generously publish the results of their detailed international research on their websites and uh, a lot of information is available at, your, at the touch of uh, your fingertips. Um, they've brought Argenti's work up to date in effect from 1955 onwards and they've traced numerous families and ancestral lines that he omitted from the Libro d'Oro. Um, now in terms of Raleigh Brothers, um, the, the Raleigh family uh, was aware from a very early period that it was quite special, and they themselves published a book as early as 1896 here in London uh, that you can see there on screen. Um, it was a, uh, a family history um, in English. Um, it's indicative of two things. One, that they, were, uh, they had rather quickly become anglicized and um, uh, assimilated into British culture within 50, 60 years of arriving in the United Kingdom. 
And uh, secondly, that as I said, they were, they, they were aware already that they were something special. And they, while the book was privately published and not distributed and sold in bookshops, um, it had a wide enough uh, audience um, for them to make a, a certain point. Um, they weren't your typical diaspora, Greek diaspora family. It's as simple as that. Um, the, the book is also indicative of the, the social ascent of the family that um, was, went, was pretty precipitous. Uh, by the end of the 19th century, they were quite well known in, in, in UK society. Uh, and this sort of self-awareness seems to have been um, confirmed when only a few years, well, 15 years after the book was published, uh, Strati Rally, who was the, the head of the family, was, was bestowed, he had a hereditary title bestowed upon him by the King of England. Um, and th thereafter, the genealogy of the Raleigh family in great detail was published in, in Burke's peerage on an annual basis. So the, the elite were very well aware of the existence of the um, Raleigh family, as were everyone else. Um, this is a slightly more uh, detailed family tree. It shows the, descent, uh, the descendants of Stephanos Rallis, uh, who was a silk and grain merchant, uh, we're not entirely sure, um, born in the uh, middle of the 18th century. He settled in Marseille after 1822, um, and he was the father of the Rally brothers. They belonged to the Javieras Accescufotos branch of the family. There were several branches based in Hios. This is the one that uh, the Rally brothers themselves belonged to. Um, this chart, which I've got up there, you can't read it, of course, but it shows the descent over four generations uh, from Stephanos Rallis at the top. At the next row is his sons, the five Rally brothers and their sisters, and then descends over uh, several other generations to the, up to the fourth generation, which is the one that would be the generation of our, uh, some of our parents and some of our grandparents. Uh, um, and you can see the numbers in the, in the family, in the genealogy here. This includes only the male line descendants. So it's the sons and daughters of the males only. We don't show the descendants of the females because then other, otherwise the chart would become too large and unwieldy for one slide. Um, but it shows that the family grew tangentially. Um, here we have the first generation of the Raleigh brothers who settled in, in the UK, um, all five of them. Um, it's probably worth pointing out that before the 1820s, before they settled in the UK, the, there was a rally presence that has been traced in other cities, Constantinople, Smyrna, Livorno, Odessa, and Marseille. This is before the, the War of Independence, before the massacres of Eos. They were present already, probably as silk merchants and to a certain extent grain merchants, perhaps dealing in the products of Asia Minor, which is just opposite Eos. Um, but in terms of the coming to the UK, the, the first two to arrive were Zanis or John, uh, Zanis is on the left here, and he came, he was the eldest of the Raleigh brothers, he came with his youngest brother Eustratios, or Eustratius, to use the English pronunciation, he's at the bottom right. Um, uh, to give part of biographies of each of them without going into too much detail, uh, Zanis and Eustratios arrived in London certainly by 1818, possibly earlier. Um, Zanis later left the UK and went to Odessa where he represented the company, the family company, for many years. Um, interestingly, he, of all the brothers, was the only one not to marry a Hian, because we're talking about family networks here. His wife was Italian from Livorno, Lucia Storni. Um, he married her in the 1820s. It was probably uh, a fairly controversial step. And he and his descendants, who you see on the left, well, they were on the left of the chart that you saw earlier, settled in Russia, and they were the exceptions to the rule. So I'm not going to be talking too much about them. Um, too much about them. Uh, the second brother, who Katerina already referred to, uh, Pandya Rally, Pandyas Rally, um, he was the head of the Rally Brothers Partnership in London. He's the one who appears in the middle here, in the middle top row. Uh, the partnership which was formed in 1826. Um, interestingly, he was only naturalized a British citizen in 1852. Um, I don't know if he was hedging his bets and waiting. Um, other, his younger brother, Eustratios, was naturalized in 1847, and there were other Greeks who were naturalized earlier than that. I think it's interesting to, to perhaps one day when someone has time, we can look into why they waited a bit uh, before they, they were naturalized. Um, yes, so Pandias, he became the leading member of the Greek community in London for many uh, decades. He served as Greek consul general. He was known as Zeus uh, by his compatriots um, because of his lofty stature. His wife was Marietta Scaramanga, that's another name which we're going to be repeating. 
um, of Chios, of course. They had two children, uh, a son who married his cousin Alexandra Rally, and a daughter, Julia, who married in 1853 Charles Monk MP. So we see a very early Anglo-British, uh, uh, Greek-British marriage alliance at this stage in the 1850s, within 30 years of their arrival. Um, he died in 1865, and the initial partnership was dissolved on his death. The brother, Augustis, who was on the right, uh, top row, represented the family in Marseille, the family business interest in Marseille. He married his second cousin, Sozonga Rally, um, and they had uh, three children who married into the Rally, Argenti and Rodokanaki families, all from Hios. Tumazis, on the bottom left, represented the Rally brothers in Constantinople. His wife was Maruko Argenti, and they had six children, of whom more later. And finally, Abstratios, uh, who, as I said, came to uh, London with his brother Zanis in 1818. He was involved in the creation and running of Rally brothers in London and Manchester in the 1820s and thereafter. Um, as I mentioned, he was naturalized in 1847. His wife was Mary Mavro Gordato of another Hian family, and they had nine children, uh, all of whom uh, married into Hian families, all of whom I've mentioned apart from one, uh, so Scaramanga, Rally, Mavro Gordato, Vlastos, uh, Vlasto, and Argenti. Uh, and interestingly, he's the person who laid the foundation stone of St. Sophia Church in 1877. Uh, so he was a leading member of the community at that point. Um, now, to briefly go back to business and com uh, commercial uh, history, what were the trading interests of the Rally Brothers during the first 50 years of its existence? Well, as I said before, the 1820s were not certain, but most probably silk from Hios, raw materials from Asia Minor. After the 1820s, mainly grain and tallow from the Russian Black Sea ports, Odessa and Taganrog, silk, indigo, and metals from Asia Minor, and perhaps to a certain extent, Chios. Um, the principal branches of the company were in London, Marseille, Trieste, and Odessa. Um, in 1837, a branch was opened in Tabriz in Persia that dealt in silk and uh, Persian carpets. In 1851, they opened their first branch in India, in Calcutta. Uh, and they later, later, of course, became very famous as East India merchants, and that's what they're best known as. Ten years later, they opened, uh, in 1861, they opened an office in Bombay, followed by a network of uh, offices all over India. And in 1869, they opened an office in New York and an office in New Orleans, which dealt in American cotton. So this is an early example of a, a global company, mainly staffed by family members in the wider kinship network, uh, as I mentioned at the outset. We often talk of Rally brothers, but we don't talk about Rally sisters. Well, they had <laughs> five, uh, several sisters. These were the, the first generation of Rally brothers. Um, all the husbands of all the sisters and the children of all the sisters were involved uh, in the business. Uh, and to very briefly run through them, I don't have, I wasn't able to find images of all of them. The eldest was Plumu Rally. She married uh, a distant relative, Alexander Rally of the Pizis uh, branch. Um, they had children who married into families I've mentioned already, Argenti, Petrokokinos, Rotokanaki, and Skaramanga. Um, their second son married a Petrokokinos, uh, Petrokokino. Um, their third son, Pandyas, was involved in the foundation of the branch uh, of Rally Brothers in Persia in 1837, as I mentioned. Um, the second uh, sister in, the, in chronological order, uh, Vieru, married into the Aguilasto family. And this was an Aguilasto who in May 1837 was also involved in the establishment of the Tabriz uh, branch of Rally Brothers. You see how they involved all their brothers-in-law in the family business. Uh, the third sister was Argyro. She married into the Psiaki family, Psiakis, also of Hian origin. They had two daughters. One married a Rally. Uh, the other one married a Condostavlos, a Condostavlos also a Hian fam both Hian families. Condos Davlos in particular was an East India merchant in Salford and Liverpool, clearly involved in the Rally Brothers enterprises there. The younger sister, whose photograph you see, Marigot, um, married Petros Skilitsis, or Peter Skilitsi, um, also a Kios. He was an India merchant, largely in Marseille, but briefly in uh, Manchester. And he was involved in, in the Rally Brothers partnerships um, in Marseille. He ran them, in effect. It was under the name Rally Skilitsi and Argenti. His daughter, Julia uh, Scalizzi, married her cousin Ambrose Riley. There's no need to worry about the connections. And he was the person who established the Bombay branch of Riley Brothers in 1861. 
So I've mentioned a lot of names, but you can see how they were all involved in the network, uh, the family business network uh, from the outset. That's why the marriage alliances were concluded. It was all strategic. Um, just to show the wider network, a few years after this, and it connected to Marigot, whose pictures you, uh, picture you see here, she had um, a relative. Um, uh, this, what you see in front of you, is the fair par, or the death announcement of someone called uh, Georges Psomadis, George Psomadis, who died in Switzerland in December 1892 at the age of 29, as it says in, Fran in French. Uh, probably he may have died of tuberculosis, we don't know. He himself isn't important, but this death announcement that was printed in Paris and sent to relatives and friends um, mentions no fewer than 24 families to whom George is related to, the major all of whom are blood relatives and we can certainly assume business connections as well. I haven't looked into it in great detail, but I would say, and for 50% I'm certain. Um, the list, which I won't go through in exhaustive detail, it starts with close relatives, his mother, his siblings, his aunts and uncles. The families mentioned include, uh, of the ones I mentioned already, Agelasto, Rally, Petrokokino, Vlasto, Negroponte, uh, Negroponte, I haven't mentioned, that's another Hian family, and Parembli, another Hian family. And then the second and longer list is of first cousins. Um, these, this brings in families not only from the Hian network, but you see that by the 1890s they'd expanded, and they weren't only marrying uh, uh, Hians, but families mentioned are the Zarifis family of Constantinople, Simiriotis family, also of Constantinople, originally from uh, Kithira, Efthimopoulos family, I don't know where they're from, uh, Broinstride, who are Belgians, they're the only exotic ones in the list, Baltadzis, uh, Smyrna, Sinavinos, Hios, Salvagos, Hios, Metaxas, Kefalonia, Valianos, Kefalonia, um, Vlastos, Hios, uh, etc., etc. In the list, it's, they'd all, someone had compiled a family tree before the list was written down because everyone is mentioned, even if it meant repeating the name, every branch of the family. And interestingly, the Raleigh family is mentioned no fewer than three times in these lists. It was important for lesser known families like the Psomadis, I think, to emphasize their connection to Raleigh brothers um, or to the Raleigh family in general. Um, yes, so that's a little aside for the, Ra for the Raleigh sisters. To go to the second generation of Raleigh brothers, um, the head of the family was, uh, well, they were descended from Eustratius, who was the youngest of the five brothers who came over in, the 18, uh, in 1818 and 1820s. Um, he as I said, married Mar Mary Mavrocordato and had four sons and five daughters. Um, his elder son, John, uh, died relatively young, uh, and he married into the Scaramanga family, but had no children. Um, in 1865, after his father's death, though, he had founded a new partnership. So Raleigh Brothers uh, was transformed, and this was with his first cousin, Stephen Raleigh, who was a brother of one of the other Raleigh Brothers, Augustus, Augustus. Um, so they created a new partnership, this is in 1865, after the death of the last um, surviving uh, Raleigh brother, the first generation. Um, anyway, as I said, John died young, and the head of the family uh, and the company um, went, uh, headship of the family and company went to his brother, Lucas Raleigh. Um, he was married to Eugenie Argenti, who was the aunt of Philip Argenti, who I showed at the very outset. So you see the close connection between those two families. Uh, they had five children. Uh, uh, yes, you can see who they married into on the slide, uh, the Raleigh family, the Scalizzi family, and the Economo family of Trieste, um, which also had Raleigh connections. And there was a son, Leonidas, who died unmarried, unusually. Um, Sir uh, Lucas joined Raleigh Brothers in 1879, and like the other members of the family, he had to work his way up. He had a stint in India. Um, uh, he, he uh, on the death of his brother, uh, he joined the company. Um, he actually retired in 1892, but then for some reason, 10 years later, rejoined the firm and re re remained at the helm until he died at the age of 85 in 1931. So he controlled the company for many years. Um, the Indian interests of the, of the Raleigh brothers were greatly enhanced while he was in control, but he was the one that closed down the American cotton business in 1903 when it no, obviously no longer became lucrative enough to, to carry on with it. Um, he was created a baronet, so a hereditary knight, by King George V in 1912. And this was sort of confirmation that the family had arrived. He took the title of Sir Lucas Raleigh of Park Street in the city of Westminster. 
But I'm, I'm sure I've read that members of the Rowley family, his own immediate family and the wider clan, felt that he shouldn't have accepted any title less than Baron. So it was considered a bit of an insult that he was only offered the title of Baronet. But he still accepted it, and um, uh, the title survives in the family, as we'll see. Third generation, uh, son of Sir Lucas, Sir Strati, he was the second baronet. He married a lady uh, called Louise Williams. So here we see a marriage outside of the traditional he in our Greek network. And it's very interesting because this lady had no particular connections of any kind. Um, uh, so he was, he was consciously making a move that would have not been well accepted by the family or the wider uh, network, but he did it anyway. Uh, maybe he married for love. We see in the middle, early 20th century that people could finally do that. They weren't only arranged marriages. Uh, and they had four children, um, of whom more later. He himself joined the staff of Raleigh Brothers in 1898, and he had to work his way up as well. He became a partner in 1920, so some time later. Um, but he was uh, eventually, and inevitably perhaps, appointed president when the, the Raleigh Brothers partnership was transformed into a, limited, uh, into a firm in 1931, uh, following the death of his father, uh, Lucas, Sir Lucas Raleigh. Um, he was the one who oversaw the expansion of the company into sub-Saharan Africa after 1933. Uh, and he remained at the helm of the company until 1950, and then he eventually retired completely and stepped down from the board of directors in 51. And at the bottom of this slide, I have a list of the uh, senior management of Raleigh Brothers in 1931. You see it's a rather long list. Of the 15 names, 12 are of Anglo-Greek still. So in 1931, it was still very much controlled. It was a Greek interest. Um, all, almost all related, I would say, by marriage, with maybe one exception. Um, and of, of the names you see there... Uh, oh, sorry, we, don't have, we don't have that slide on the screen. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yes. Thank you. You should have told me before. Anyway, here's the information about Sir Strati Raleigh. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so at the bottom you see the list of uh, senior directors of Raleigh Brothers in 1931. Um, as I said, 12 out of the 15 senior managers of our Anglo-Greek origin. And the last two, Alexander G. Vlasto and Jack A. Vlasto, are actually referred to on the slide that I had up there. Um, it just wants to show you how they brought in another family that became involved in the senior management. Um, the reasons for this are, uh, I'm not entirely certain what the business motivation was. It might have been someone invested quite a bit of money in Raleigh Brothers at a certain point. Um, and there was also a family connection in that um, the sister of Sir Lucas Raleigh, Calliope, was married to Alexander Vlasto, and he's the one um, who moved to London in 1866 to share the management of the company. And his son, who you just saw on the list of senior management in 31, uh, became a partner in 1911 and he controlled the company with Sir Strati Raleigh after 1931. He was married to someone called Erat Oskaramanga, again, another name that you've heard about, uh, so within the family network. And his grandson, Jack, was the, actually the last chairman of Raleigh Brothers, the last president. Um, so it had left the Raleigh family hands uh, in the final decades of the business, which we'll see on the next slide. Uh, and I just included Jack's sister, Betty, on the slide to show, I mean, she married into the British aristocracy in the 1920s, just a further example of the integration of these Anglo-Greek families into the upper echelons of British society um, uh, at the time. Um, in 1951, the Raleigh brothers published a book. Um, this is 100 years after the foundation of the Calcutta office. Uh, it's not a coincidence, I don't think. Um, and uh, the book provides a prodded history of the family, uh, of the family business, uh, and it has an interesting list of the commodities they were still trading in in 1951. Cotton, jute, oil seeds, grain, still piece goods from Manchester, very interesting, uh, and some other things, shellac, hides, and sisal. Um, and it also includes, to get back to shipping, um, uh, a subsidiary company that they had, a maritime shipping and trading company, uh, with a list of uh, the six ships. Four were in existence in 1951 and two were on order, so the family had diversified. They'd always, I think, had a certain interest in shipping in that they probably had shares or owned the ships that carried their goods all along, but I think still we need more research into how, what percentage they owned of these ships and everything and how, how, very, how involved they were actually in the shipping side. Um, so that was it. The fourth and final generation of the Raleigh family, um, this is when uh, the sons of St Sir Strati Raleigh took over. Um, the eldest son was Sir Godfrey uh, Victor, Raleigh, who died in 2010, so recently. 
Um, he joined the company in 1931 and served as vice chairman from 1946 until the company ceased to exist in 1961, which is when it was bought by the financier Sir Isaac Wolfson. Um, he also succeeded his father as the third baronet, obviously. The second brother, there were two in this generation, um, worked for Raleigh Brothers in Japan and India. And interestingly, in a sort of throwback to the old um, strategic, well, marriage alliance patterns, but not for the same reasons, he married a Greek, uh, Katya Drulia, who, whose family came from the Peloponnese. She was also related to the um, Retsinas family of industrialists in Greece. Um, obviously, this was a, a love match and not a, a strategic alliance, but it's interesting how in the final generation that controlled the family, there was a Greek alliance. And that, that kind of thing interests me because I'm interested in the family networks. Um, and then I have uh, this sort of conclusion after the sale of Raleigh Brothers, the two, uh, the company, the family company, the two brothers opened their own investment firm, which lasted until 1975. And after that, the family ceases, uh, the family name ceases to exist uh, on, in the company register. Um, do I have enough time? Or, um... yeah, Very briefly, I wanted to talk about, uh, I'm talking about family uh, and business networks. Another branch of the Raleigh Brothers family didn't focus so much on business, they focused more on social networking. It's sort of alternative form of networking. These were the descendants of Tumazis Raleigh, uh, Thomas Raleigh, and his wife Maruko Argenti. Um, he was one of the five Raleigh brothers. Um, he was the one that represented the family in Marseille. They came to London in the, in the early 1850s. Um, they had several children, only two survived to adulthood. But these two children were the ones that focused on the social side of uh, networking in the UK. And their uh, career tra trajectories, if you can call them that, uh, reveals a, differently, a completely different type of success. Um, uh, and also a, a trend to move outside the confines of the traditional he and business and uh, marriage networks. Um, the son, Pandeli Thomas, oh, he was born in Marseille, um, naturalized a British citizen in 1866, so he wasn't born one. He started his career in the company, in the family company, uh, but he, he inherited a substantial fortune from his father, who died when he was very young, which allowed him to considered an alternative career, which was politics. And he entered, um, well, he ran uh, uh, here in the UK, and he was successfully elected Liberal MP for Bridport and Dorset, and later for Wallingford and Oxfordshire. I'll give you the dates in the slide. And he also held the offices of Justice of the Peace for Surrey and Deputy Lieutenant for Dorset. So I'm not sure he was the first Greek MP, and I, I, I think there might have been one who preceded him. But um, he was successful in politics. The fact that people in Dorset and Oxfordshire voted for him and elected him is an interesting statement. Um, his social networking included friendships with Lord Kitchener, who, who was actually staying with him before he left on the, on the journey on the ship that went down and he, he cost his life. And King Edward VII as well, um, which I think says a lot about the social acceptance of the Anglo-Greek families at the beginning of the 20th century uh, by the British establishment. His sister, Janie, which is probably Zenu, but they called her Janie, um, was married as early as 1866 into uh, an establishment family, I guess you could say that. Her, her husband, uh, Richard Morton, was the son of the Earl of Ducey. He was a civil servant and courtier. They served in Canada. He was controller to the Marquis of Lorne, who was the governor general there. And he later was uh, a master of ceremonies to three successive British monarchs. Um, and he was knighted on his retirement. Interesting, that their marriage in 1868, if you scratch the surface, you'll always find a Greek. Um, it was performed by William Thompson, the Archbishop of York. That doesn't sound Greek at all. His wife was Jane Skeen, doesn't sound particularly Greek, but Jane Skeen's mother was Ralu Rizu Rangavi, the sister of Alexandros Rizos Rangavis. Um, so there's a Greek connection almost everywhere if you look uh, <laughs> closely enough. Uh, and he actually performed the marriage. Um, Gladstone attended, as did his wife. Um, and their daughter uh, wrote memoirs, and she claims that her mother was the first Greek to marry an Englishman, and I have the quote here. Uh, it's definitely not the case, because her mother's first cousin had married a, an Englishman in 1853. Uh, I guess the daughter forgot when she was writing her memoirs. Um, and Jane herself uh, was a courtier. She was the uh, lady-in-waiting to one of the daughters-in-law of Queen Victoria. So you see quite an amazing social ascension uh, of the family. The daughter, uh, Evelyn Marie Morton married the Honourable Julian Bing in 1902. He became famous in World War I as the commander of the Canadian troops uh, at the Battle of Vimy Ridge. Um, he was a very 
distinguished military leader, not one of the World War I generals who had a bad reputation. And she was a typical army wife and uh, um, colonial uh, stalwart of the Anglo uh, establishment, I guess you could say. Uh, Julian Bing was raised at the peerage in 1917. Uh, after he served um, as the 12th Governor General of Canada between 1921 and 26, he was raised to the rank of Viscount, Viscount being a Vimy. His name is still very well known in Canada. Um, when they returned to England, he became commander of the Metropolitan Police. But uh, here you see them in all their viceregal and imperial glory as Governor General of Canada and his wife. So the, the, grand, uh, the granddaughter of one of the Raleigh brothers had r risen to the level, you know, vi viceregal, representative of the King and Queen in Canada. It's quite amazing if you think of the um, complete assimilation, really, uh, of the Raleigh family into the British upper classes within three generations of the arrival of the Raleigh brothers in the UK. Uh, that's all I have to say. Sorry if I've gone on a bit too long. Thank you, Katerina. I have a small cold, but I'll do my best not to disappoint you today. So, does history matter? When Dr. Papakostadino invited me to this roundtable discussion, she suggested that I present my research on the development of Greek shipping institutions in the 20th century the re-establishment of the Greek community in Cardiff and London before and after the Second World War, in relation, its relations with the British and Greek government, the repatriation pact to Greece, and the important role of the Greek Shipping Cooperation Committee in safeguarding Greek maritime interests abroad would all be topics of interest to anyone fascinated by the creation and development of Greek maritime institutions. As I'm not strictly speaking a historian, I chose not to deliver a presentation on an exclusively historical topic. As a public share of a Greek shipping magazine that has been circulating since 1931, I have decided to present to you my thoughts on how maritime history as an independent area of study is being addressed and embraced in Greek universities and merchant marine academies today, and why re-examining the past may be important in order to understand today's challenges and future advancements. Today, the Greek education system offers 11 public and state-controlled merchant marine academies located in areas with a significant maritime tradition. Merchant marine academies in Greece are run by the Ministry of Merchant Marine and organized by the Hellenic Coast Guard. They are not considered universities, but have a somewhat peculiar legal status as institutes of higher education. For various reasons, there are no private merchant marine academies but the previous government was in favor of promoting private education in this sector. The Greek education system also offers two business schools focusing on maritime economics in Piraeus and the island of Chios, one technical university with a marine engineering school, and one technological institute in Piraeus with a marine construction program. In all four departments and schools, various teaching, educational, and research programs amalgamate different sciences and theoretical disciplines in order to prepare students for this challenging industry. There are also at least five private educational establishments that offer degrees mostly in maritime business and economics. Finally, I have also counted 43 business and economic schools in Greece and eight departments of history at state universities. So how has maritime history developed as a course or an area of study in all these universities, colleges and institutes? Unfortunately, no maritime history courses are offered in any of the 11 merchant marine academies in Greece. Consequently, the students at the Merchant Marine Academy in Hydra, one of the oldest academies in the world, or the islands of Chios, Inuses, Syros, Evia and Kefalonia, have no understanding of the maritime tradition and the historical importance of the towns and islands where these schools are located. At the universities offering degrees in maritime economics, maritime history is again neglected, although not totally forgotten. At the Department of Maritime Studies of the University of Piraeus, maritime history is a compulsory course, but it is not taught by a maritime histori historian or even a historian for that matter. At the Department of Shipping, Trade and Transport of the University of the Aegean in Chios, maritime history is not a compulsory course. And again, it is not taught by a maritime historian or even a historian. In all the technical universities and private education establishments, maritime history is not at all taught. Among all the business and history departments in state universities, only the Ionian University offers courses in maritime history. 
to other public Greek universities established in important areas and ports with a long-standing maritime tradition and heritage, offer no courses in maritime history, and research programs in this area of science are very scarce, if non-existent. <coughs> Dr. Matthäus Loss and Professor Jelena Halaftis were probably the first academic researchers to focus on maritime homelands in Greece and on the role of tradition, networking, and most importantly, of family unity in the Greek shipping entrepreneurial paradigm. In the academic work, Dr. Loss, but especially Professor Jelena Halaftis, have discussed path dependence in relation to Greek shipping development. For those who are not well acquainted with this term, path dependence refers to the idea that decisions we are faced with today depend on past knowledge and that decisions finally reached may be limited by past experiences and practices. Path dependence means that current and future states' actions or decisions depend on previous states' actions or decisions. Thus, the future may not be deterministic but biased towards early decisions. In other words, business, as well as political history, matters in today's decision-making situations. Therefore, the historical development of institutions has a strong influence on strategic planning. We, especially in the shipping industry, are influenced or even restricted by our past choices. Academics, as well as entrepreneurs, seem to agree on these notions at least. Professor Halafi's PhD and academic work over the past two decades have focused largely on how the past has exercised a significant pressure on the development of Greek shipping entrepreneurship. Professor Yanis Totokas and Professor Thanos Palis, among others, have also conducted extensive research on how traditions, culture and long-standing values of the Greek shipping industry have shaped Greek maritime institutions, including companies, professional associations, traders' unions, government bodies and the media. So, if according to so many scholars the past shapes the future of the maritime industry, how should maritime history be embraced by the Greek educational system today? Before answering the, this question, let me first give you some more disturbing facts. In this respect, allow me to present to you a university Aegean research on the sociological profile of young Greeks that have selected a career at sea. Who are the young professionals entering the maritime arena in a country with a celebrated maritime past? The study anal analyzes the sociological and economic features as well as the aims of the young people who decide to pursue maritime and marine degrees in Greece in order to follow a profession associated with the sea. It does so by presenting and analyzing the results of an annual survey conducted since 2009 in all Greek national marine academies and universities offering such degrees. Among the various findings, one is of particular interest to the friends and lovers of maritime history. The change and widening of the social pool when students come from. As you can see from the tables, we have found a progressive increase of students that do not identify themselves as associated with the shipping or the maritime world before their enrollment in the maritime, in the Mesa Marine Academies of Greece. Collected data reveal a decrease in students whose hometowns have a strong maritime tradition. There is also a decrease in the percentage of students coming from families where at least one of the parents has working experience in the shipping world. More importantly, we have one finding that should be addressed. The vast majority of the students have limited knowledge and information regarding the shipping world, while 10% of the students have no knowledge whatsoever. So why are these findings important? If history does matter, and if path dependence does play a vital role in the shaping of Greek shipping companies' strategy today, when the new generation, then the new generation of maritime cadets or maritime economists focusing on modern and useful sciences are missing one fundamental parameter. The unique idiosyncrasy of the employers as well as their own ability to identify conditions that have in the past and may again influence the present of the industry they are hoping to work for. Although today's scholars, both in Greece and abroad, are doing their best to preserve our knowledge about the past, I am afraid that Greek society is somewhat indifferent, if not downright suspicious, of our work. Economists forget that it is through historical data that their findings and theories emerge. Legal scholars sometimes ignore the fact that selective, selecting evidence from the past is fundamental to supporting a case in court. 
political analysts also overlook the fact that behavioral routines, social connections, and cognitive structures are built around and then shape institutions. If maritime nations need to learn more about their past and their claim history, then not only the state, but also representatives from the capital market should insist in re-examining the science's contribution to industries that are part dependent, such as the maritime industry. Universities and merchant marine academies need to review the syllabuses. Private institutions need to explore possibilities for funding research projects that would not only keep our maritime history alive, but more importantly, would make it an interesting and thought-provoking area of knowledge for the younger generations that now entering a career at sea. Greece's maritime paradigm has developed over time. Professor Halaftis and Dr. Papakostadin's book presented to you today is a fine example of the ongoing research on the century-old development of the Greek maritime phenomenon. If all of us, academics, entrepreneurs, media publishers and politicians fail to understand the significance of, of our past and how it may shape our future, then our maritime history as Greeks will be forgotten. And tonight's thought-provoking discussion will be reduced to a family affair between sui generis scholars and individuals fixated on the past. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are open for questions, if we have anything to discuss. Thank you. Yes? Uh, John, this is my name. Um, I'd just like to ask a question about the rallies. Um, could you perhaps um, clarify whether or not they were Orthodox Christians or whether they were from a different uh, denominational set? The name to a Brit does not sound Greek, and I wondered whether or not they might have uh, a Jewish uh, the, yeah, the name rally, as I kept saying it, is the anglicized version. The Greek version is rallis, with an S at the end, like all Greek surnames in the masculine form, rallis. And the rallis family itself was Greek Orthodox. As I mentioned, Evstratios laid the foundation stone of Hagia Sophia in Moscow Road in uh, 1877. Uh, they were very much involved in Greek Orthodox affairs, both on their home island of Pios and here in London and in Marseille and in Trieste. Everywhere there's a Greek Orthodox church that was built in the 19th century, the rallies are almost uh, certainly involved. Paris as well, the church in George B Rue Georges Bizet. Um, they claim themselves that the name is uh, derived from Raoul Pau de Luc, who was a crusader who went to, to Byzantium in about 1000. Raoul was somehow transformed into Raal or Rallis, they added a Greek ending. The family was eventually Hellenized in Rallis, is the name that was derived from Raoul Pau Skin of the Wolf. Um, whether or not that's true is open to question, but that's what the family themselves like to think. But the name itself is encountered in Greek sources from the 1200s onwards, Rallis, as Rallis. Yeah. 